Good morning, my name is Julie Kogan and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Business and Vice President of RMIT. Welcome to the fabulous Capital Theatre and a special welcome to our council members in attendance. And that terrific ceiling light show was put together by our talented students studying digital media. Something special for us. And as you would have seen before coming into the theatre this morning, this place has a rich history full of traditions. If you're interested in knowing more, because it was opened in 1924, lots have happened since that time, please join us in one of the tours that we're offering straight after this event. Another important tradition in Australia that has occurred for thousands of years comes from our Aboriginal people. And the tradition was to welcome those from other lands. So if you were crossing into another country, you would request permission to enter country and a safe passage. And in turn, you would show respect for country by following the rules and the customs, as well as acknowledging the traditional owners of that land. So following this tradition, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Boomerang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation, whose unceded lands we have the privilege to conduct RMIT business. I would like to acknowledge elders and um, the custodians and uh, the emerging past and present leaders. So today we have something special for you and we have a three amazing speakers. We have Jason Laufer from LinkedIn. We have Katrina Sedgwick from ACME and our very own Vice President and President, Vice Chancellor and President Martin Bean. Um, we're going to have three individual um, presentations and then our guests are going to join me for a panel event, um, a panel discussion. We, we want to get your questions. So we're going to, we've got a URL and soapbox and the URL will be coming up on the screen shortly where you can log in and you can send your questions. So let's get started. We've got students with us, we've got staff, we've got industry partners, and a wonderful reason to come together is to discuss disruption, the future of work, and how we can stay competitive in our careers. So I'm going to invite our first speaker, Jason Laufer, to the stage. Jason is an experienced technology professional and Senior Director of Learning Solutions Asia Pacific at LinkedIn. He has more than 20 years of leadership experience, including roles at IBM, Microsoft, Gateway Computers and Westpac. Jason is going to talk to us about the top 10 job skills in demand and the most in demand jobs. Please welcome Jason to the stage. Thanks, Thank you. Hi everybody, great to be here. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna communicate emojis. I was very impressed by that. I don't have an emoji skill, but my eight-year-old daughter, Sophie, actually does. I'm gonna start with the story of someone who uses a lot of emojis, and that's my daughter. Ever since she was really young, I'm talking two or three, she's got, had a love of animals. And she would love to be a vet when she grows up. This is her passion. She's really inspired by animals and caring for them. Now, as you can see, we have a pet dog and a cat, Angus and Hamish, and she's dying for a pony. She said to me about a year ago, hey, Dad, what do I need to do to be a vet? And I contemplated being eight and now 48 and thinking about how skills have changed. And I really couldn't fathom what it would be like in another 20, 30, 40 years of what veterinary science will bring. But there was something that was key that I shared with her. So if you imagine a time where you're with a patient, a dog or a cat, it's very sick, and unfortunately that dog may need to be put to sleep. How would you deal with its owners and its family? Things like compassion, resilience, dealing with ambiguity, the human skills are the things that you really need to double down on. Being a good person, being kind, some of our family values, continue on that trajectory and you'll make an awesome vet. So that's what we focus on. But who can imagine what are the skills of the future? I'm very privileged that I work for a company called LinkedIn. 
we've got a really good snapshot of what's coming. We have over 650 million members on the platform, and we actually track their moves around the skills they're learning, the jobs they're moving into. We've got 1.3 trillion exabytes of data that moves around on a daily basis that we get to play with to really start predicting those trends. <clears throat> so, we know that on the World Economic Forum's latest report that 65% of jobs for the next generation don't even exist today. How do you predict it? We have a bit of fun with you. Who likes a game? Yep, okay, great. So, let's actually start thinking about, all right, what are these new industries that are coming up? So, who's ever heard here of the commercial drone industry? Only started existing in the last five years, about a quarter of the audience. Who wants to be an environmental minimizer? Has anybody any idea what that actually is? Or a drone docking designer and engineer? There's new roles in industries that are only appearing over the last couple of years. So imagine the new industries that are coming. 3D printing. You can print a house. You can print an organ. It's pretty amazing how we can save lives now. The world is changing, and with that, new roles are appearing and new skills are being developed to do exactly that same thing. I potentially, I love the three-dimensionalists. Hmm, I kind of feel like when I was in university, I was doing three-dimensionaling, but that's another story altogether. Um, <laughs> let's move on to cryptocurrencies. So, you'd have to be laying underneath a rock not to actually read in the press how this whole industry is appearing, and people are concerned. It's turning the financial systems upside down. I know I'm concerned. Do I get on the boat? Do I not? Do I invest? What do I do? So who do I turn to? Maybe a cryptocurrency theorist and an evangelist. Has anybody heard of that role before? No, not really. Um, and then agriculture. Now this is one industry that once upon a time was planting seeds, having crops, thinking about the cows and the sheep that you had out in your paddock. That industry is changing so radically through automation and technology. And bio meat factory engineers. It's astounding, isn't it? And molecular gastronomists. So just a curiosity from me up here on the stage and looking back at you, who would have actually heard about the, let's, let's take a poll actually, I want a hands. Um, if you've actually heard of 10 of those roles, put your hands up. Okay, I've got about half a dozen hands. And this is the future. These are the roles that we're actually seeing appear in our platform. And do you feel suitably geared up for them? Well, I can tell you what, most of the world don't. So 42% of current and past graduates feel their degree requires transformation to keep pace. Education, vocation, is being turned on its head because no one can keep up with the pace of the new jobs that are created by technology. It's an amazing world what we live in. It's also hugely disruptive. So how do you keep up? Well, we're fast shifting into the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I don't know if you know Heather McGowan. She's a future of work strategist. I love her dearly. She's amazing. I've been fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with her. And I love how she has this theory in regards to when we were at university at school, you learnt to work. The world's changed. You have to work to learn. No longer do you go and get a university degree and you stop learning. And that's your career for life. Life is a lifelong journey exercise. I know that we all hear about this and you read about this and hopefully in your organisations or at university you're being lectured around this. But you really need to embrace it because as you saw in the roles before that I highlighted to you, we can't even predict what's next. I've got a little bit of an idea and I'll share some more with you very shortly. Um, so we're somewhere in the middle here and what I ask all of you is really embrace this and to change your mindset to work to learn, that every day is a learning adventure, that you're continually learning new skills to A, get a competitive advantage, B, make sure that as we're seeing vocational displacement, we can actually help those actually reskill and get new jobs. And ultimately, it's all being fueled by technology innovation. <clears throat> so how do you navigate all of this? It's the 1.5 trillion exabyte question. So there's two ways you can actually do this, and some advice that I'll give you and some things I'll share with you. One is a very data and insight-centered approach. If I think about the great work that RMIT are doing around partnering with different uh, vocations and different organizations, they're really getting data from a multitude of sources to start predicting what is the future of work and the future of education. I'll talk more about that in a moment. 
The second is around a human-centered approach. And you may ask what that is, I'll cover it in a moment, but ultimately we speak about human skills and we talk about human-centered approaches. That's what comes from the heart and the mind that computers and data and insights can't predict. So let's take it away and let's talk about ecosystems. So at LinkedIn, as I mentioned, we have over 650 million members growing three members per second. We have the great privilege of looking at that data and assessing what's next. And essentially, we create an ecosystem. And I'm going to talk specifically around learning here, because obviously, we're talking about skills today. And I thought it would be very interesting for you. So skills, courses, instructors, learners, admins, companies, government, and then higher education, like RMIT, coming together to really build a plethora of information that helps us actually interpret what's happening in the world. So whether it's the skills that are being produced and new skills on a daily basis, whether it's the jobs, whether it's the type of courses that are being created on the platform like ours at LinkedIn, or the curriculum that's being um, created by RMIT and other universities around the world, what instructors are actually instructing about. And then on our platform, instructors have the opportunity through social mechanisms to actually talk on the, on the platform, so via chat, so lots of emojis hopefully, um, with their learners to ask questions. That becomes social, it's viral, and what happens with all that data is we understand what people are concerned about, what they love, what they're focused on, what they're driving forward with, the skills that they're learning, and so forth. And with that data, creates great insights. And what do we do with insights? We start to predict. And having a data-centered approach with great insights really allows us to actually start thinking about that future of work, those future of skills that will really bring things together so therefore we can actually create a better world. The second area I'm going to harness on is a human-centered approach. So when I actually start thinking about a human-centered approach, I really look at four core areas, and I really want us to harness down on a couple of these. One is accessibility and availability. So earlier I shared with you that, hey, once upon a time, you got a degree, you went and learned, and then you went and worked. Life's changed, and it's changing rapidly by the second. Accessibility and availability are key. So as an organization, as an education institute, as an individual, how do you actually ensure that you've got accessibility when you need it? We talk about micro-credentialing, we actually talk about snippets of information that you need at a point in time that you may, have to, you may need to discard. I often say the biggest learning adventure is actually unlearning. It's getting rid of the biases that you actually have so you can learn new things. And having accessibility and availability when and where you need it is important. You could be on the bus here today to learn a new skill because you're actually meeting with somebody for an interview after this. Or it could be that you're working on a large project and there's one particular skill that you actually need and then you're going to discard of that. It could be that, hey, the information you have is outdated uh, and for you to actually be uh, relevant again in the industry, I need to learn those new skills. But learning when and where you need it. Marketing. So this is more applied around education institutes and also organizations. The world of learning has changed. And acting like a marketer in a university or as an organization is important to reach your audiences and attract them. But it's not just about attraction, it's feeding them the information they need at a particular point in time. It could be, say for example, like on LinkedIn Learning, where we actually feed the relevant courses to in, uh, in, or, individuals on the platform when they're actually looking at different types of content and marketing to them to say, hey, this may be something that you actually need. It could be the same whether you're on the RMIT website or it could be whether you're on the RMIT learning portal, that at that just in time, you're actually driving the right content to those individuals so therefore they're getting what they need and that they want to learn. Because let's face it, we all have conflicting priorities. And as an organization and a learning institute, the ability to market at the right time to ensure that it services when that person needs is super important. Tribes and social. Who doesn't want to be part of a tribe? If you think back to the elders, past and present, of this land today, they worked in tribes. They're on the land in tribes. And they acted in tribes to make sure that they could support one another. Tribes are in the heart of the human. 
And it's no different today in the way of learning and in the way of technology. We work as tribes. We learn as tribes best. So how do you actually create a tribe and a social experience to make sure that you can come together and learn, that you can share, that you can actually share those experiences and collaborate? Because not everybody learns by reading a, a textbook or watching a video. They need to communicate. They need to ask questions. And providing a portal or platform is important. And as a learner, how are you reaching out to others to create those tribes to become better? And then finally, around purpose. Life has changed. I love millennial and the Gen Zs coming up. All the studies and research, and also my individual dealings with them in the workforce is they really love to work around purpose. They're much more purpose-driven than us Gen Xs, or the baby boomers as well. And it's actually a gift to society because a lot of, I guess, the challenges that we had in our generation, they're learning from. So the ability to actually help them work with purpose and align to their purpose is going to be paramount to help them with continuous learning. <clears throat> I'm just going to switch gears because I guess it wouldn't be any LinkedIn presentation if I didn't actually share some data and insights, and I know that's what you're all looking for. So just really quickly, the top five emerging jobs in Australia. Who would have thought the customer success manager was the top emerging job? The reason for this is because this rise of technology and the fourth industrial revolution, people don't know how to use it. They need to be instructed. We work in tribes and we like to learn from each other. So these roles are paramount to ensure that the technology that's being produced and the change that we're seeing is fueled. And the other four, you're probably not surprised, are hugely technology related and uh, very much in demand in Australia. And I'm also gonna share with you the most demand skills for 2019 as well. So if you're a university student here today, this is what I'd be focused on if you want to get a great job and if you want to be uh, relevant. Uh, if you're actually from industry today, probably not a surprise and maybe thinking about how you reskill your workforce around these. I'm going to start with human skills. Because what's more important than human skills? I shared the story about Sophie, my daughter. If she carries through with these human skills, she's going to be very viable in tomorrow's workforce. Some call them soft skills. I personally prefer calling them human skills. Creativity, persuasion, collaboration, no surprises up there. I think what's fascinating though is when we start looking at hard skills or more technical skills, eight of them are technical, but two are very people orientated. Sales leadership and people management. And this really relates back to that whole human skill element that no matter what industry you're in, people are always gonna have to sell and create revenue for an organization. And people leadership is at the core of who we are so we can align to the purpose that we spoke before work in tribes and so forth. So a little bit of some data that I thought I'd share with you today. So on that note, three core areas maybe to take away. One is that the world has changed. We now work to learn. Gone are the days you get a university education and then you go and work and that's it. Life is a lifelong learning journey. The second is data and insights are your friend. If you're scared of data and insights, Unfortunately, you're not going to traject in the future. And as an organization or a learning institute, how are you truly harnessing those data and insights to actually help propel your institute or your organization forward? And finally, take a human-centered approach. We're all people. Think about the tribes, the purpose that you work in, and how we bring people together. So on that note, thank you so much for having me today. It's been such a pleasure to be here in this theater. And I'm going to hand back over to Julie. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jason. And as I mentioned earlier, this is some um, on the screen coming up is how you can lodge your questions to the panel to go soapbox. Um, from Jason's presentation, it's pretty clear that the new job currency of the future is skills, um, but our future still has a human face. I'd like now to introduce Martin Bean as our next speaker. And Martin is the Vice-Chancellor and President of RMIT. He was appointed as Vice-Chancellor and President in January 2015, and he previously held the positions of Vice-Chancellor of the Open University. That's the UK's largest academic institution and a global leader in the provision of flexible learning. Martin has worked at Microsoft, Novell, and a number of other companies integrating technology and learning systems. 
and he's going to talk about disruption in education and RMIT's solutions. Please join me in welcoming Martin. Well, good morning, everybody. Woman Jika, it's fantastic to have you back at the Capitol. I love performing, so I built myself a theater. It's not a bad, bad way to go, really. So, uh, and it's, this is my first performance since the opening, so you can all rate me afterwards in the, uh, in the evaluations. I will warn you, you have a highly caffeinated bean this morning, so I'll be uh, whipping through the presentation fairly quickly as we go. Julie, thanks so much for that wonderful acknowledgement of country that you did for us as we began, and I just want to join you in just thanking the people of the Woomarung and Boonarung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations for welcoming us to their land uh, and, uh, and to all the places where RMIT does our business across Australia and our islands. I want to thank their ancestors, elders past and present, and of course, emerging leaders for all that they do to celebrate the great richness of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. So Jason, thank you very much. Jason and I are on a, on a journey of disruption together and we deliberately didn't compare our notes today, um, but you'll see there's just some wonderful commonalities and overlaps as we, we go through. Uh, I'm obviously uh, from RMIT and I'm talking about shift. I used to say shift happens and then I got into trouble, so we just talk about it now as shift by RMIT. And you know, Jason gave us a bit of a sense as to all of the drivers of change that are disrupting the world of working in our communities. And if you're sort of a Radio National listener, as I am on the way into work this morning, it was, you know, there was an amazing discourse just about the, the impact that artificial intelligence is having uh, on us. And when I returned to Australia after 30 years, uh, about five years ago, you never would have heard that discussed uh, on the radio. And it just reinforces for Jason how quickly everything is changing. But you know what? I think the, the mother of all changes was the internet the great disruptor of our time. And I was really proud of the fact that I was there when it was born. I'm pretty sad that we didn't think through some of the downsides. We only wanted to think about the upsides, but just look at that growth. From 2000, about 371 million people connected. Today, about 4.3 billion. And as we know, it, um, device after device now are just being tethered to this worldwide um, network. And as you may have seen, it's becoming the new battleground, sadly. Uh, as we seek uh, to sort of establish our way, our way in the world. But I do believe um, it is the great disruptor of our time. Jason talked about this. He actually was a little bit more pessimistic than me. He went up to 65%. I'm sticking with 50% for now. The jobs are at risk in the next, in the next 20 years. But you know what's interesting about that um, is just how it's underpinned by shifts in our economy. And that was talked a little bit about on the radio this morning as well, if you were listening. And it's interesting because Australia has been on a transition from sort of 1988 to 2018. 1988, we were still very much agriculture and manufacturing. Fast forward to today and you'll start to see dominant sectors like healthcare and social assistance starting to predominate in terms of where the big skills gaps are in, in our economy. But as Jason really cleverly pointed out, it's not that agriculture and manufacturing have gone away, but the way we go about agriculture and manufacturing has shifted dramatically, and hence why the skills and the workforce need to shift along with it. But the good news is, for some, is that whilst all of that disruption has been going on, we actually have increased the number of Australians in the workforce. And that's why I, I truly, I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature, but I truly believe that as these jobs are displaced, there's two, three or four other jobs that can be created if we as a nation have the courage to work together to understand our comparative advantage, to move from a world where we're largely underpinned by what we dig up and what we grow to a world where we continue to exploit our brains, which is why I'm so incredibly proud of the fact that Australia is one of the top three nations in the world for educating human beings at a tertiary level. And I kind of despair a little bit when the media portrays that as somehow a problem for Australia, that we welcome citizens of the world to be educated in the Australian way by Australians with wonderful institutions like RMIT and others in the sector. This is sort of where we were in 1900. Simple sort of world, one lifetime job. I want you to now think about the fact that today's 15 year olds, and I have one, I might talk about her a little bit during this presentation, her name is Georgie. She's likely to have 17 different 
employers and five different careers in her lifetime. And what's interesting, and if you, and Jason touched on this as well, because two thirds of jobs, sorry, Jason, I use soft, I'll replace it with human from now on, will be human skills intensive by 2030. But that makes sense, doesn't it? Because the more the robots, the bots and artificial intelligence gobble up the jobs that are done today, the more the, the comparative advantage for human beings is going to be able to become innovators. It's going to have to do the creative thinking that the robots just really can't do uh, on their own. I, I am struck by a quote I read back in the 90s though by John Nesbitt who said, the factory of the future will have only two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog and the dog will be there to stop the man from touching any of the machinery, uh, <laughs> which I think is quite, quite clever. And this is sort of, according to Burning Glass, they believe that there are 14 skills that have become foundational in the new economy. Human skills, business skills, and digital skills. And Jason touched on that as well. And what's interesting about that taxonomy is that the average advertised salary of jobs requesting at least one of these new foundational skills was greater than 15% the average of other jobs. And when it comes to the ability for, to have mobility and managerial level, those are the things that are being rewarded more and more. And so as Jason said, the ability to learn will be a graduate's most valuable asset in the future world of work. If you take nothing else away from our presentations this morning, for those of you that are parents or have influence over people uh, entering the workforce, or more importantly, for every one of you that is still in the workforce, our ability to learn for life is going to be our most valuable asset. Now, there's, that's because we now have two different systems. We've got my system at the top. I'm not quite a baby boomer, I'm a bit younger than that. But here's my world. I grew up in a world where from zero to five, I got to play. From five to 25, I got to learn. Yep, that's learning behind me. 25 to 65, I got to work. And then 65 plus, I get to play all over again. Pretty simple, quite predictable. We stole all the wealth, we wrecked the planet with superannuation to the max. Um, and we're gonna live happily ever after. And as I tell my kids, give me a couple more years and I'm going skiing, spending my kids' inheritance. <laughs> the new model though looks something like this. Play, school, job, 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 with learning the whole way. That's the new world. And the challenge for universities is how we remain relevant to everybody that needs us in the new world. Because we have to start thinking now, all of us as knowledge as a currency. You know, we used to think that the old currency looked like this, the diploma. We still give them out, they're still really valuable. It's sort of a rite of passage. We hang them on the wall to make our parents and grandparents feel fantastic. Uh, and in my generation, they were super critical. Because if I could tick that box on the resume, it wasn't that I would get a job, it's just whether I would get the job that I really, really wanted. But today, we have to think about a knowledge portfolio. We have to think about how, we, how do we represent ourselves in LinkedIn or in other portfolios to bring the whole of us to life. Uh, and, and that has to include everything, in my opinion, from pretty well year seven through to the current day. That's how we need to construct our personas as to who we are. And all of that needs to be tuned to be able to be discovered in a world of digital and social media, where if we do that well, we may not get the job, but we dramatically increase the likelihood we'll be discovered and we'll get the interview on the pathway to the job. And I thought what might be interesting was to hear from one of our uh, students about the impact that that thinking had on his career. We live in a competitive age where most people have a basic education and skill set for their given profession. People skills and things like that have never been more important. I was an introvert growing up, so being able to blend in and communicate didn't come easily to me. I spoke multiple languages when I arrived in Australia, and yet I struggled with the dissonance of being lingually capable, but not being able to say what I wanted to say. I chose all my microcredits to improve my communication skills, and as a result, I'm now capable of having a constructive conversation with a complete stranger. 
is a skill I don't think I would have acquired by conventional means. I got an opportunity to take part in Australia Post Accelerator program, and the interview was demanding of the applicant. I had learned how to move discussions forward, overcome nervousness, to listen and have a constructive conversation, and that was a crucial factor in helping me land that opportunity. These skills are there to be learned, to give us an advantage. At the end of the day, we are in control. It is our responsibility to become the best version of ourselves. I think a pretty interesting story of an individual self-motivated to be able to then develop just a, a ride-along competency to help him be successful in taking that final step into his dream career. Now, what I thought was also interesting, though, was to take a little bit of a look at accelerators into full-time work. I, I spent a lot of time mentoring young people, and I sort of despair when I see sort of parents that are friends of ours or people at the school that I talk to that are sort of rigidly and dogmatically saying, it's all about the grades. It's all about the grades, because it's not. It's not the way the world works now. And when you look at accelerators, enterprise skills, experience, connections, and more and more and more resilience is what employers are looking for. And I had this awesome conversation on Friday night with a wonderful woman where we were talking about our kids and saying, well, how do you really evidence resilience? And you can, here are some of the, the ways. Building enterprise skills in education, so like business creation skills, entrepreneurial skills, doesn't mean you have to start your own business, but it means you know how to innovate. It means you know how to bring ideas to life. That's likely to give you about a 17 month advantage. 5,000 hours of relevant paid employment, it's gonna give you a 12 month head start. Paid employment in a future focused cluster that Jason was talking about, it's gonna give you about a five month head start. And I love this one. An optimistic mindset will get you there two years faster. And I, I think all of them are a proxy for resilience. I think these are the types of ways that you can evidence in your portfolio and who you are that you've sort of had that tenacity to stick with it, to be able to juggle multiple priorities, to be able to do things with people from all sorts of different backgrounds to get ahead in life. And if you think about your own life journey and if you cast your way back, you'll realize how some of those formative experiences, for me that was the first paper run, or getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning and jumping in the front seat uh, with the milkman, getting ready to deliver the milk bottles, drinking a, a half liter carton of Big M chocolate milk which was my breakfast at the time and the only thing that got me through. Th those are the days, or, or working the night shift in the Shell service station on the corner of Ferntree Gully and Springvale Road, and I recognise about seven of you from those, those times, by the way. Those, those all made me, they all resulted in me being able to tell a story about Martin Bean that is a story of resilience, of tenacity, of humbleness, all wonderful attributes that the world of work is seeking and needing every single day. Jason put this quote up, it was from EY, 40%, 42% of current and past graduates felt their degree needs to be overhauled. And what does that mean to them? Reshape the sector, prioritize the student, who would have thought? Deconstruct the value chain, unbundle the degree, subscription-based learning, just-in-times options, and innovate with industry with business. I personally think they've nailed it. And that was a challenge they gave to every Australian university to look at how well they're future-proofing the education, not, not to make money, but to do the right thing by our graduates. Because our mission at RMIT, unashamedly, is to get our students ready for life and work. And that means we have to be prepared to disrupt Here's the way we think about the world, the world of a disrupted university. You've got a whole plethora of micro-credentials that people can take just in time. Not credit-bearing, they're available right now. In fact, through platforms like Coursera and FutureLearn and edX, there's literally thousands of free courses being studied by millions of people all over the world from some of the world's top universities. And then you've sort of got these MISO-credentials. They stack and they add up and we start to confer university credit on them so that they can be paid forward. And then they, they collide with the traditional ones, the macro credentials, the higher education and vocational education programs, courses, and degrees. But then we get out of university and we get into the world of work. 
and we realize that a lot of what we've been taught is semi-perishable. Those skills become redundant as we move through. I often joke, some of you will remember a thing called DOS. I was a Microsoft DOS wizard. I could do things with DOS that nobody could believe. At a certain point in my life, I had to realize I needed to let my DOS skills go. Uh, and that chuckle says a great deal in this room. So we get into the workforce, but then we've got to start coming back and getting those MISO and micro credentials all over again to top up those semi-perishable skills so that we can remain current, we can remain vibrant, and we can live the lives that we and our families want. And I'd like to think, with the help of some amazing people in this room uh, and, and a bunch of great thinking in helping us inform that RMIT is leading the way. And I thought I'd just talk a little bit how we're doing it. But before I do that, though, to the RMIT people in the room and perhaps to our students in industry, I want, you to remind you, I want to just remind you, though, that this isn't a new population for RMIT. 42% of our students are already over the age of 24. And as Daryl knows, that statistic hasn't changed much over the five years that we've been working together. We've always been, from 1887 as the Working Man's College, we've always been an institution that has thought about helping people, irrespective of their age or background. If you need education to get ahead, you come to RMIT. That's what we do. So we, we set about to launch creds, micro-credentials for all of our undergraduate students. Uh, and the whole idea is that you can choose what you want to do. As Jason said, it allows you to append skills and competencies to what you're studying. We'll give you a digital badge to put in your LinkedIn profile or seek or wherever you choose to do it. And also on your transcript so that your employer is not just looking at your grades, they're looking at the creds as well. Uh, and you'll be able to share those in whatever social network you're in, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you are. Those are transportable digital badges that are being fine-tuned to with semantic connections to the web crawlers so that you will be discovered. According to LinkedIn in a study they did about three years ago, in an area of skills shortage, somebody with a relevant micro-credential is searched for 11 more times than somebody with a bachelor's degree in the same area. Somebody with a bachelor's degree and the micro-credential, I can assure you something pretty remarkable happens in your ability to be found by those who need you. Uh, and the success has been overwhelming. In two years, without any credit, we've had 37,000 students uh, flock to them. Um, and we've embedded now 43,000, and we then embedded them in degree structures. We've had 43,000 students take them, but the stat I'm really loving is that students enrolling in more than one, voluntarily, 64%, and they're claiming their badges at a rate of 94%. For the students in the room, I am so proud of you for recognizing that these are the things that are going to give you that leg up when you choose to step into the labor market, and it's also you getting on a journey of discovery for life. But we didn't stop there. Um, we also created RMIT Online because we knew we needed a way to help our alumni and working adults come back and get those semi-perishable skills. So in just two years, we've had 3,300 enrollments in our short courses. We've got 26 future skills courses in market today in 2019. We have 50 partnerships that we've formed with uh, leading technology and other organizations. Uh, and the average weekly sessions of people coming to our website uh, is up to 32,000 per week this year versus just 4,000 in February last year. Put it another way, these things are on fire. And why are they on fire? It's because when you bring a great institution with wonderful teaching capability together to help meet skills shortages in our communities and in the, the, um, the jobs that we partake, then some pretty miraculous things happen. And I'm so proud of the partnerships that we've been able to form because they come in all shapes and sizes, whether it's the wonderful ACME, and we're going to hear about that in a moment, or organizations like ABC Fact Check, or, or Adobe, or Corrections Victoria Inside Out program, or Hands On Health, and the list goes on and on and on. And it's also wonderful technology companies like Udacity, where we've launched our first self-driving car course, uh, but we're also introducing courses in AI programming, Python, robotics, software engineering, front-end web developer, a lot of the ones that Jason just had up 
on the screen as we talked about before, or whether it's with Amazon Web Services, where we've launched some amazing programs in AI and VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality. And when we launched with them, since the launch just last year, we've had over 108 million uh, marketing impressions talking about and discussing those courses. Uh, and, and that was a world first for RMIT and Amazon. We were the first institution anywhere in the world to launch with them in their Sumerian AR and VR programming language. And so I thought it'd be nice just to uh, share a couple of quotes with you before I wrap up. This is from Andrew Coe, who's the Managing Director of Global Education at Amazon Web Services. RMIT's approach to contemporary education and creating a next generation workforce to support the jobs of tomorrow is truly world leading. We look forward to continue to innovate with RMIT across educational reform and digital student experience in Australia and the global market. Amara's Law. We tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. Ladies and gentlemen, to Australia's peril, will we underestimate the disruption that is going on around us but together we can create an unbelievable future for our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. And on the screen, prepare your questions. This is how to access Go Soapbox and send them through for the panel that'll be coming up shortly. It is reassuring to know how RMIT is really keeping pace with changes in the external environment. And I did note that Jason listed the number one job in demand was customer success management. And this is just another example um, of what we're doing at RMIT because at Academic Board earlier in this year, we just endorsed a graduate certificate in customer success management. And that will be four digital blocks that'll be out in market very, very soon through RMIT online. So I'd like now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Katrina Sedgwick. And Katrina has been the director and CEO of ACME since early 2015. She's worked at the ABC and the Adelaide Film Festival and has an extensive background as a performer and create creative producer. Katrina is on the board of the Australian Film, Television and Radio School and Creative State Advisory Board. She's gonna to talk to us about how technology has disrupted creative industries but how soft skills or human skills, as we're calling them now, have stayed strong throughout. Please join me in welcoming Katrina. Thank you very much. Um, it's fantastic to be here. And yes, we're so thrilled to be a partner of RMIT and it's such a kind of fruitful um, collaboration. Um, before I begin, I too would like to acknowledge that we meet here today on the traditional lands of the people on the Kulin Nations and pay respects to elders past and present. So, obviously, digital media permeates our lives in ways that were unimaginable even a decade ago. Powerful creative tools to make, share, distribute and watch media content now lie in the hands of the many rather than the few. And equally, we're in a time of convergence and constant change where, as the previous two speakers have said, nimbleness and flexibility have become core skills as we move across platforms and technologies, working collaboratively and across previously siloed disciplines, and as audiences find increasingly inventive ways to consume their content. There's my, there we are. As we pivot into the new economy, and the economy of the developed world turns increasingly away from the hard industries, jobs in manufacturing and many service industries will vanish. The robots, or specifically automation, are coming. Um, we've all got different statistics. I think mine is the most optimistic, probably because it was uh, set up in 2016 uh, by the CSIRO, but they predicted that 44% of Australian jobs are under threat by the new industrial revolution. But the robots are coming with us, 
enabling us to do more, to explore new ideas and to expand our creative horizons. Governments and corporations and policy, policy makers recognise that the soft skills that we've been talking about so much, uh, resilience, curiosity, entrepreneurial thinking, vision, empathy, insight, will be vital to drive our future and are skills humans need to learn that robots can't replace. These buzzwords are absolutely central to the humanities, to the creative industries and the arts. They are our DNA. They've always been thus. We need to invest in these areas of learning and industry to provide the resources needed for R&D to explore and push technology and platforms to create content with a focus on science, research and innovation as long-term drivers of economic prosperity, jobs and growth. And $1.1 billion was committed over four years, which was fabulous. But it was incredibly frustrating that as a national agenda on innovation was established, vital for our nation, it neglected to propose a focus on and vitally provide investment in leveraging creativity and the creative industries across our economy. The new technologies and digital tools that are available to us can be harnessed in creative ways to break down silos between content creators and platforms and vitally between disciplines to remove traditional barriers to access and to foster innovation. We need to move on from STEM and into STEAM. From the beginning of the animation of the moving image, media makers, artists, journalists, filmmakers and technicians have experimented with these new platforms to tell and share stories and ideas in new and exciting ways. Multi-trillion dollar global industries are not successful just through their technologi technological innovations, but because of the power of the stories that these technologies deliver to audiences. Technology provides a tool and a platform it's content that is queen. Artists and the creative industries push form. They take risks. They look at digital tools in different ways. They are entrepreneurial and they're about content. For the federal agencies that have faced unprecedented cuts in recent years, Screen Australia, the Australia Council, the National Film and Sound Archive, the ABC, SBS, it's vital to remember that the value to remember the value that creative experimentation and innovation bring to technology. We've got to ensure that we're supporting and developing those practitioners who've got the talent to shift the dial and really break through to make new discoveries and find new and significant audiences. Creativity thrives on experimentation and risk. It's not safe, outcomes are not guaranteed. The cuts to the federal agencies have reduced their capacity to support their, this experimentation and it's slowing down the cultural innovation of our nation. There are fewer opportunities for fewer practitioners, barriers are coming up, reducing diversity as choices inevitably become safer and outcomes are judged more and more on their quantitative rather than their qualitative outcomes. And when we talk about innovation and STEM, we also need to break down the silos that separate the creative um, industries from the STEM disciplines and drive an agenda of STEAM. And it's fundamental that the university sector is, is doing this. It requires a holistic, strategic approach across the economy and the education sector to break down these traditional ways of learning, of researching, of working, to create a new, more dynamic, interdisciplinary ecology. Consider one of the very successful startup communities in Australia, particularly in Melbourne right now, the games industry. The multi-trillion dollar games industry is now bigger than the global and film and television industries combined. And I'm probably speaking to the converted here at RMIT, but let's get beyond the cliche that games are only for sweaty boys playing first person shooters. Video games are as broad ranging in their form and as creative an industry as film and television, and they're offering content for everyone and anyone. While the industry has major issues with gender diversity on the production side, half of, of all video game players are women. So the audience is very balanced. The game industry is all about innovation and business. And because the success of a game is not just code, but storytelling, design, sound, music, user experience design, it's not STEM, it's science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and the arts, it's STEAM. Investing and collaborating with artists 
can bring exciting new applications of technology for businesses. Lynette Walworth is an Australian artist whose work right across her career has been pushing the boundaries of the technology she works with to tell urgent social impact stories. Her most recent work, and we're seeing a little bit of footage here, um, is a work called Awavana. It's a virtual art, a reality artwork that she made at the invitation of and in collaboration with the Yawanawa people of the Amazon basin, who saw the possibilities that 360 degree video had to tell their story. Lynette wanted to scan the forest and the community in incredible detail. And through her production partner, she was able to take one of only three ultra high definition LIDAR scanners available in the US at that time. And this is only about 18 months ago. She was able to take the LIDAR scanner with her crew to the Amazon basin. The LIDAR scanner collects 300,000 points of data per second. Lynette was seeking a way to harness this brand new technology to create footage that she says was at once completely specific and ethereal at the same time, to match the vision state the Yawanawa was seeking the VR work to express. Lynette returned to the US and through Sundance, she had a residency at the Technicolor Experience Center in Los Angeles to undertake her post-production. She worked with Technicolor's team to deliver this very complicated work and to ensure its seamless interactivity. Technicolor saw how Lynette had pushed this new techni technological tool and they've now bought a fourth LiDAR scanner in the US and they're now applying it to many other projects. A residency of this kind has not only been hugely be beneficial for Lynette, but also for Technicolor. And that's why this 100 year old company has an artist in residence program to see how artists experiment with these tools and then apply them commercially. At Acme X, our co-working space, we've just completed running an accelerator program for Creative Victoria. And we've run it in partnership with the State Library of Victoria. It's for Victorian startups in the creative industries. 12 companies were resident in our co-working space at Acme for a two month program, which applies tech startup methodologies to creative businesses. This is the third accelerator of this kind that we've run in the past 18 months. And as I understand it, it's one of the first that have ever been run in Australia and very rarely run globally. It's early days, but investing in these creative industry companies and supporting them to build sustainable businesses has huge potential. Change is really hard. And we're always happy to go with the status quo even as the need to change and the opportunities it offers are staring us in the face. In 2005, I presented something rather quaintly called DigiDay at the Adelaide Film Festival. It investigated new online or at that time cross-platform possibilities and what they could offer traditional screen practitioners and their audiences, not only for marketing opportunities, but for new ways to extend their storytelling and reach um, and to get to audiences in new ways. It was clear at that time that only a few practitioners in, in the Australian industries were thinking creatively about how to harness the new technologies and digital platforms for their businesses and their storytelling. A decade later, after commissioning millions of dollars worth of films, television programs, animations, shorts, and online arts programming at both the Adelaide Film Festival, then as head of TV arts at the ABC, I found that the industry was largely still in the same place as a decade before. Old school approaches still rule the roost. Unlearning, as Jason was saying before, is absolutely critical and it's really, really hard to do. But what happens when somebody thinks outside the box? These are images from Barry Kosky's absolutely extraordinary production of Magic Flute that was presented at the Adelaide Festival earlier this year. His company, uh, the Berlin Commercial Opera, collaborated with the brilliant theatre and moving image company in 1927. And you can see the results. Essentially, it's a set that's entirely projected onto singers. And it's so magical and playful. It's a hybrid work. It takes a very traditional form, opera, and pushes it together with the moving image in such an innovative and wonderful way that entirely new audiences are discovering the magic of Mozart's magic flute. It's thrilling. We need to ensure that our young people are being trained for the new reality, the traditional model, the auteur who has a long-term career creating cinematic works is still important, but the reality is that an even rarer few will be able to have a career in this space. 
Instead, successful screen and media production practitioners need to be nimble, pushing form, experimenting with different platforms, finding new audiences locally and globally. And for many graduates, a future career will be about applying their skills in new contexts. Virtual reality in mining and engineering and aged care, augmented reality in retail and advertising, games in defence and tourism, filmmaking in the performing and the visual arts. Moving images, the practitioners, artists and industries and the technologies that deliver the stories and experiences are central to our lives and to our futures right across the economy. We need to embed the creative industries into our national strategy for innovation, education, research, alongside and with the STEM disciplines. It's vital not only for the cultural enrichment of our society, but equally for the enrichment of our future economy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katrina. I'd now like to invite Jason and Martin back over to the comfy lounges for a panel discussion. Thank you very much, everybody. That's a, another round of applause for our, our um, speakers. Thank you. I, I suppose my, my first question is around, we've been fortunate in Australia, despite GFC, global uncertainty, we've had a solid run of economic growth, consistent over a period of time. One of the downsides of this is that it can lead to complacency. So Jason, I'd love to get your view on how well prepared is Australia for the changes coming in terms of the skills and how we're doing? It's a really great question, Julian. Thanks for asking. There's a real disconnect between what industry is feeling versus what society is feeling in Australia. I'll start with the PwC latest CEO survey. And it shares that 80% of CEOs today in Australia are really concerned about the future of work and future of skills. Not having the right skills, but also how do they gear up the current workforce to ensure that they can stay competitively advantaged. And it's almost like a paranoia. And 10 years ago, CEOs weren't concerned about talent. We all know we've kind of been around. It was like, ah, oh, talent, whatever. They're more focused on the bottom line, top line, around results and so forth. Now, CEOs are more concerned and more focused on talent than they've ever been. But unfortunately, there's a disconnect with society. So earlier this year, we ran a survey across the Asia Pacific region around the future of skills. We went out to over 4,000 individuals in the APAC region and actually assessed what are they thinking. And across the APAC region, 56% of our respondents said they were personally concerned about staying relevant and actually quite dubious about their future. That's across the region. In Australia, is only 36%. So there's a real disconnect where we're looking at India and Singapore and other markets in Japan. They're much more concerned about their relevance, but individuals in Australia aren't as concerned. Mm. And why is that? Well, I think we can hypothesize, but Australia has a little bit more of a laid back type attitude. And unfortunately, individuals aren't keeping up with learning. But what is fascinating though, if we compare that to when we're looking at how they're feeling about the type of curriculum courses and learning that are being provided in their workforce, 76% of them said that what they were being provided by industry wasn't good enough. So not only are they at this point, maybe a little complacent compared to the rest of our peers across the region, they're also saying they're not given the opportunities in their industry. Mm -hmm. So I see there being two things that can happen there. First is if CEOs are really concerned about keeping up competitive advantage and talent. What are the learning opportunities they're providing for their employees? And secondly, how are those CEOs educating the workforce today, and we all have a responsibility in industry, to educate about the significant changes and the upheaval we're seeing with the fourth industrial revolution? Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I'm, I'm not surprised by that because it really doesn't matter how novel or unique your strategy is, if you haven't got the skills in place to implement it, then it's meaningless. Um, Katrina, you talked about people holding on to old models mm. in, in your presentation. And you know it's pretty um, clear that technology is disrupting the creative arts and the way people develop content. But 
still, the status quo is there, and not just in your industry, in other industries, I'm sure, from members of the audience would, would agree. How do you go about, can you um, unpack for us in a little bit more detail about how do you get people to challenge the status quo? I, I mean, I think it's incredibly challenging. Um, it was interesting, when I was at the ABC, Mark Scott was still director, yeah, yeah. and uh, he, he was a really fantastic um, leader. And he had this really kind of urgent agenda mm. when he was at the ABC around, you know, seeing ahead and understanding mm. that that kind of traditional broadcast um, model was going to be utterly disrupted. And he, you know, brought in iView and, and really kind of mm. uh, transformed uh, how audiences engage with, engage with that content. Um, but his big lesson was that he'd been at the SMH yeah. before yeah. and he had been in boardrooms, what must be now... 15, 18 years ago, and been in conversations where people had said, change is coming, do we need to worry about it? No, 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 it'll be fine. And look mm. at what's happened to those newspapers. Yes. I mean, what, they're a quarter of the mm. thickness that they were, mm. you know, uh, 10 years ago, five years ago. Um, and it, he said it just taught him a lesson of complacency mm. is so dangerous. I mean, you've got to look ahead and understand mm. that everything is changing. I think, too... You can't underestimate the importance of direct intervention. Um, you know, in our workplace and, you know, within, within my kind of environment, which is obviously very specifically around mainly sort of uh, more art house end and experimental art-based content, um, how do we get people to experiment and play with new platforms that they might not even consider they could have access to? So an example is we've, we've just... Um, uh, granted our third commission where we have an $80,000 commission which is for visual artists who are working in a gallery-based space. Um, they may do sculpture, they may also do video art or whatever. We've invited them to create a work in virtual reality. It's something that practitioners would have never considered before, but they've gone into that space. They've done it really successfully. Mm -hmm. So Christian Thompson made one, uh, Joan Ross made one. Um, they're going on to exhibit that work all over and it's changing the conversation. So I think... Of course, there are large kind of government policies that need to be put in place. Obviously, the education tertiary sector is absolutely critical, and I would say primary and yeah. secondary mm. sector as well in terms of, you know, readying up that next generation. But also, I think we shouldn't underestimate those sort of small yes. interventions yeah. that are sort of like create a ripple effect mm. that change the conversation, change minds and show through best practice opportunities that other people can pursue. And I know that Mark Scott, um, who, who I know quite well, said also it's about how you define your competitor. So, it, you know, News Limited and Fairfax really um, looked at each other as the competitor and, and not Yahoo News, Google News and all the digital platforms. Absolutely. Martin, you finished your presentation with that great quote, Amara's Law, um, but you didn't get a chance to really explore how it applies to our sector, higher education. Have, would you be able to do that now? Yeah, and it, and it really builds on the back of um, what my co-presenters and panellists had here today. And I, can I just thank you for your time and giving to RMIT today? Yeah. So much appreciated. Another round of applause yes. for them for being yes. with us today. You know, every, uh, Julie, every day when I drive uh, into work, I, I spot the license plates in front of me, and many of them still have Victoria, the education state yeah. uh, on it. Yeah. And I'm really struck by that because uh, we are very proud and very dependent on education as a part of our economy and communities. It's something mm -hmm. we do really well here. And yet, you know what I'm struck by, Julie, is how little in my sector, when I'm together with the other vice chancellors, we talk about disruption and innovation. Now, Clay Christensen, the really famous uh, professor from Harvard who wrote a book on disruptive innovation, he said, the new entrant nearly always wins. And the reason why the new entrant nearly always wins is because they look at the world where the world is now and going, rather than being trapped in their business model or their ways of working of, of today, and trust me, I've worked for companies that at one stage, Novell's a great one, we had 85% of the network operating system share in the world. We had these palaces all over the world, neon signs, but we were completely outdone by the new entrant because we were trapped in our way of thinking and didn't really embrace the internet the way that we needed to. So for higher education, my big fear is 2012 was a really pivotal year these things arrived called MOOCs, massive open online courses. They had the best university brands in the world 
giving away short courses through platforms that I spoke about before, Coursera and edX and FutureLearn, et cetera. And all of the headlines came out. The university is dead. The university is going away. The university has no place. So all of my contemporaries got to 2013 and looked around and said, well, we're all still here. Nothing to worry about. Back to business as usual. And that's the peril of Amara's law. Yeah. We overestimated the disruption in the short term, but meanwhile, mm. it's bubbling along behind mm. the scenes. Mm. And what I'm really worried about is that if we don't have the courage to disrupt ourselves and reinvent ourselves, I don't know who those new entrants are going mm. to be, mm. but somebody's going to invent a better model. And whether we like it or not, people are going to move to that other model because it will serve them better and it will help them live the lives that they want to lead a bit better. And, and quite frankly, we've been here since 1887 as RMIT. I'll be darned if I let RMIT be disrupted by a new entrant because we've always changed as Melbourne and Victoria and Vietnam have needed us and that's our challenge now. And that relates to that open mindset that you spoke about in your presentation. We've got some questions coming in from um, Soapbox now. Uh, the first one reads, future jobs are unknown, CVs are losing credibility and competition is high. How do I actually get employed? What an awesome question, yeah. Jason. Happy to be off. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, can I That's called no. the flick pass. <laughs> no. um, it's no different to how I relate back to my eight-year-old daughter who wants to be a vet. First and foremost, focus on the soft skills, human skills. Martin played a fantastic video of that young man out there who was an introvert. And what he didn't have was the capability of marketing himself, going out and finding that job. Anybody can learn what they call a hard skill. We know the average shelf life is less than five years if you read the latest Burson report. Focused on the soft skills. How do you communicate? How do you collaborate? Do you have resilience? Have you ever had a hard knock? Can you pick yourself up back again and go, I've got a growth mindset, I'm gonna try again, I'm gonna do better. For me personally, this is the, the, lesson, the lessons I'm teaching my daughter and also at LinkedIn, the lessons that we teach our teams as well in regards to they're the most important skills you can develop because they'll help you actually get the hard skills yeah. that you need. Mm. Was, this is interesting. I was having a conversation uh, with a colleague the other day who was, who was talking about where you kind of sit in the hierarchy and how important it is of who you're reporting to and so on. And I thought about it and I thought, I've never hired somebody on the basis of where they sit in the hierarchy and who they report to. I've hired them on the basis of the, the chemistry and the sort of um, collaboration, potential for collaboration that we create in an interview context. And they get to the interview based on projects and things that they have conceived or driven or delivered successfully that show out-of-the-box thinking, that show the ability to deliver partnerships, mm. creative solutions. Mm. You know, that's what I employ for. Yeah. Yeah, so it's that portfolio of skills that you can demonstrate. And I know um, several years ago, I was looking for a, a person that um, had a, a real um, perseverance, you know, and was able to uh, consistently focus on solving a problem and eventually hired somebody who'd been out of the workplace for a number of years, but they'd managed a household and um, done a whole lot of things. And really, it was about perseverance and lots of different ways to assess that rather than that line on the CV. And I think it's really important. Sorry. No, please I think it's right. really important to just realise the world we live in now. We live in a rich media world, yeah. you know, that the CV is sort of like a a Word document, well, why would you think that's going to get cut mm. through? Mm. That portfolio needs to be rendered in really magical digital ways that come to life. Something that could be really quite confronting for people in the room. Yep. But imagine putting together your story in 90 seconds or less to camera and that being part of your LinkedIn profile. Mm. So that if somebody's looking at you, you can tell your story, your whole story, the power of storytelling as to who you are what's important to you in life and what you can contribute in 90 seconds. Now, you might not get it right the first, second, third, fourth time, but wow, if that's the anchor point in your portfolio and you mm. surround it with the formal and informal mm. markers of your life story, yeah. that's the way you're going to get the cut through. That's the way you're going to get the interview. Yeah. That's the way you're going to get into your dream job. And as Jason said, what's awesome now is all the data analytics that can sit behind that yeah. to help you put that story yeah story together. And we do that. We do um, elevator pitches as part of the, the study at RMIT. 
We've got another question that comes in. It looks like it's from a, a staff member. Um, how would you suggest those of us that are keen to embrace innovative approaching, uh, approaches and bring these to our students, kick our colleagues in the bum and get them involved? Um, so I think the, uh, I, I might, well, I'll, I'll point this one to you, but I think it's relevant outside RMIT as well. It applies to other industries. So you, you're trying to motivate and include your colleagues who may not have an appetite mm. for um, experimentation. So firstly, uh, our Executive Director of Human Resources, Ali, is in the room, and we would never condone or endorse any type of bottom kicking at RMIT, <laughs> just to, to make sure that's clear. But, but I, I do get the underlying sentiment. You know, about three years ago, great, to my great um, amazement, there was a headline in the education section in The Australian from another Vice Chancellor from another state. You won't get any more out of me than that. Uh, and he said, I've passed this decree, there will be no more lectures in our university. And I thought, this is interesting. I wonder how much investment he is making mm. in all of his academic community behind the scenes to help them adjust their content, their pedagogy, and their mechanisms to be able to make that transition. And to my great, I guess I wasn't shocked, I sort of expected it. But what I found was that there was precious little behind it. Shame on us to expect that any human being will naturally embrace something new unless we invest in them to help them make that transition, hold their hand, be their guide, and work with them along the way. So one of the things that I'm really proud of at RMIT is we're not adopting their playbook. We've rolled out some amazing technology. We've started RMIT Studios. We're investing heavily in a team of people to help our academic community go on that journey. Because you know what, Julie? These are not easy concepts yeah. to master. You don't just wake up one day and suddenly become an expert in the ability to teach differently using different tools. I'm actually, my degree is in adult education. And I spent four years of my life understanding pedagogical approaches that were built for classroom teaching. Do I think for a second that I can just apply those into blended modes without help? No. Instead of bum kicking, what we need to do is hand holding, yeah. and that's why I'm proud we're doing that at RMIT. Yeah, yeah, and that capability build is so important. Did you want to say anything there, I Jason? Do, you actually. seem to. Yeah, I, I'm loving this subject because I'm a big believer you have to lead from the front. Mm. And we have a term in the technology industry called money ballers that you find someone who's really great at what they do, the impact that they have on others. And you showcase. Mm. It's not about bum kicking for those that are lagging behind. It's about inspiring. And you know, as a leader or as an individual in the organisation, you have the ability to inspire others through change. Change is hard. Let's face it. We spoke about unlearning before. You know, as a Gen X, I'm wired a certain way, and you learn and you get on with it and you make it happen. And unlearning is challenging. But if you can have a few money ballers in your organisation <laughs> that can actually lead that disruption without actually being overly confronting with it, yeah. then people follow because they also want to be great. They just don't know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. And you let go of DOS. What a good call that was. <laughs> uh, I do love DOS. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get gonna, together we'll after. We'll talk later. Yeah. 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 You have a DOS fest later. <laughs> Another question that's, that's come in. Um, this is our final question. Um, what do the panellists think their next job will be? Um, though I think, Martin, you said that you're going to spend all of the kids' inheritance and go skiing. Um, do they think they have a job that doesn't exist? Katrina. I, I think I'm pretty traditional, actually. <laughs> I think I'm going to stay in the arts, um, you know, and I think probably I'm loving working in museums, so I think I'll stay in the kind of uh, running a building and a sort of whole little world, a little fiefdom um, kind of realm. I mean, I... I what I don't have no ability to learn at this point in my life is code. Um, and I'm trying to encourage my sons to... Um, we can help you with that. Well, yeah. we're, coming, we're coming to the RMIT Open Day, so I tell help, you. We can help as well. So Thank you. you we're, we're better. No, no, Thank no, you, no, guys. No, yeah. Come on, no, really. Uh, RMIT <laughs> Online, we've got digital blocks, module blocks yeah, for you. Uh, but I'll you know, playlist later, okay? I yeah. mean, the importance, the importance of understanding code, I'm even seeing in my workplace, you know, we're doing this big $40 million transformation at the moment. And, and technology and a really creative mm. use of 
of technology being embedded in the sort of heart of how yeah. we work together, but how we engage with our audiences during their visit and when they leave is just trans it's going to transform yeah. how we engage with our visitors and how we increase our kind of reach and impact and public value. Mm -hmm. So much of it is about code. Yeah. And younger, I mean, the person leading it is Seb, who's not young, I mean, he's mid 40s, but but he's unusual and he's come very to young. it. Very young, that's very young. And he's come to it because he was an electronic musician. Mm. That's right. how he's learned about code. Mm. You know, I mean, I just think cross-disciplinary collaboration is so key to all of this, but I don't know enough about code to move into the sort of areas that we haven't mm. th thought yeah. of before, but that is Thank just you. such a core skill. Great, what about you, Jason? Well. I got my first job when I was 14 years and nine months, because back then in the day in Victoria, yes. that's when you could get your first job. And I worked at McDonald's. Yeah. Uh, and I was fortunate enough that I studied on and I actually became a manager there. And yeah. I was also delivering pizzas when I was 18 and got my license in Noble Park, if yeah. anybody's from Victoria, um, which most of you are, obviously. And then went on and actually studied hotel management. And my first career was hotel management. Fast forward 30 years, I could not have predicted that here I am on stage talking today about the future of skills and work. And I feel privileged. So in another 30 years, when I'm in my 70s, and late 70s, I can guarantee I'll still be working. And it'll be something that'll be maybe totally different from what I imagine now. But there's one thing that stays true, that life is fluid and you need to continue to grow and learn new skills. And across my career, I've done that. Mm. But what do I imagine myself doing? Actually, something in the education sector. I've been so inspired specifically around the field I'm in now that you know, in my late 40s, it's time to start giving back. And I'd love to give back to society the way that I've learned over the years mm. to actually help Victoria and Australia grow. Mm. Okay. You think you couldn't have predicted if you'd seen my first year grades at uni, there's no way you'd think I'd be a vice <laughs> chancellor, let me tell you that. But I'd be holy dooly. Thank goodness they weren't digitised so nobody could get their hands on them. At least that's my, uh, that's my great hope. Uh, so, you know, I, I've, I say quite publicly, Julie, that this is my last, what I call it, big gig as a, as a chief executive. But um, I, I don't, the, it will be a new job because it doesn't exist yet, but I'm going to apply my thinking around the disruption of education and turn it to where I think it needs to do its greatest good at the moment, which you touched on in your presentation, which is how do you drive this thinking around um, portfolio and micro-credentials down into sort of year nine and above? Yeah. How, how, how do we actually yeah. help people stop wasting two or three years of their life and start investing mm -hmm. in their future for themselves and their families and help universities yeah. do a better job? Because we inherit just these, this new cadre yeah. of young people to help us do what we mm. do. Well, what is really clear is that we're going to be sharing our workspaces with robots and bots and artificial intelligence. So to stay ahead of the curve, we've got to invest in lifelong learning and make sure that our skills are aligned with what is needed in the market and the jobs of the future. So ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in, in thanking the panel